Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by James McCavity of Cormit to talk about its deployment in Texas. We talk about his energy strategy and its novel approach to Bitcoin mining finances. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data-dependent stories at theminermag.com. Jamie, welcome to the Mining Pod. Good to see you. Been a little bit since Miami we hung out. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, big fan of the show. Glad to glad to be here. Thank you for the, the slight chill there. I know you're a huge fan of the show, but I'll take the humility. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm excited for today's conversation. Uh, there's a lot going on. I got to know Glenn Jones, who listeners on the show obviously know as well. I think he's been on at least once, perhaps twice. He's like a savant for mining financing, which is a small market, but he's like up there, uh, Mount Rushmore style. So great to have you on the show. Talk about Cormant. Let's do a quick intro on yourself and Cormant for listeners who are not familiar. And then there's a lot to dive into about how you guys think about Bitcoin mining, your energy play in Texas, and just the philosophy of Cormant itself. Sure. So um, my name is Jamie McAvity. A lot of people mispronounce my last name, uh, McAvity, uh, or any derivation of that. But uh, um, yeah, Jamie McAvity, I'm one of the four co-founders and the CEO of Cormant. Um, Cormant is a 100% self-mining, immersion-based miner uh, headquartered in West Texas, only doing business in Texas at the moment. And a little background about me is um, I spent the first eight or nine years of my career trading energy futures on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And after that, I left trading for a little bit to build a technology company, which we we recently sold. But uh, couldn't stay away from the markets and and fell down the rabbit hole hard and in, back into Bitcoin in 2017 after sort of getting involved a little bit earlier than that uh, and ended up going full time um, right at the uh, the pico top of 2017 bull market which is kind of a rite of passage I feel like but uh, yeah great decision and uh, it was a dream of mine to be full time in in Bitcoin before I got uh, before we we started Cormant and. Uh, now, now um, Corman is a, a real business, big business, and uh, going great. Couldn't be more excited to be mining Bitcoin in Texas. Love it. Let's get a profile on Corman. Like, if you're willing, the size of the team, how you guys think about Bitcoin mining. And to that point, I think it's really important because we have so many different miners in Texas and then also within North America more generally. And I, I think that every team I've spoken to has a different perspective on mining Bitcoin, like the end product is almost always the same, but there's so many different philosophies that come across it. So I'd be interested to hear more about Corbin's. Uh, yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, we're, we're hundred percent immersion cooled. We're on the, um, the fifth generation of our immersion cooled design, uh, which is design engineered, produced, manufactured, uh, in-house by our team. Um, and the reason why we went full immersion was, uh, in response to a business decision to relocate the company to West Texas that we made in 2019. And so just looking at the environmental constraints there and building a, a cooling product that would work for that environment, the constraints I gave to our mechanical engineer, Sivan Sood, who's a, a bit of a savant himself. Uh, he's a, his parents aptly name him. Uh, it was, look, you can't use any water and it's got to work in 110 degree heat. And he said, yeah, no problem. I said, okay like this guy's confident young man. Uh, so we piloted that system uh, starting in 2021. And then uh, that was the, the second or third iteration of the system. We're now on the fifth iteration of the system. Uh, we've got about 40 megawatts or so that will be online at the end of the summer. About half that is on right now. And I would say what makes us different is that um, we are fully immersion we are fully uh, proprietary mining, so we don't have any hosting clients. Um, we own our own substation and transmission line, so um, no reliance really on any other third parties or, or hosting companies for our operations. And uh, yeah, we, we use Bitcoin denominated debt exclusively to fund our operations and a, a big focus of what I do in the business and something, another part of our business that we're extremely proud of is our 
focus on energy and electricity markets uh, and being really smart about producing Bitcoin at the absolute lowest cost possible. Yeah, you mentioned a few things that we could sort of riff on for a second there. The first thing, immersion, was that just because the, that was the Texas play or was that predated your move to Texas? And tell me a little bit about how you guys think about like the cost considerations for that given it's a higher CapEx spend. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, immersion will look better or worse depending on how much you're paying for miners. And, you know, in a, in the midst of a bull market, you maybe will spend 20% on infrastructure for every 80% that you spend on miners um, themselves. You know, in the last cycle, we saw 80, 90, $100 per terahash printing out there. And and the numbers made sense because Bitcoin was on an absolute heater when those machines were pricing. So um, immersion is is admittedly harder to um, to swallow in a market like this, where the the Bitcoin opportunity value, uh, which is you know what we call Bitcoin mining revenue expressed in dollars per megawatt hour, when the Bitcoin mining when the Bitcoin opportunity value is below ninety dollars a megawatt hour, like it is right now the cost of an immersion system is definitely a bit of a tougher pill to swallow, but ours is, uh, has been through a bunch of supply chain and design optimizations. And, um, we think in West Texas, because of the heat, the dust, uh, the weather volatility, and just general, you know, performance and lifespan that you can expect from your miners with the low cost of electricity out there, you know, immersion is, is the right choice. And, and we went all in on that a couple of years ago and and there's definitely no turning back for us gotcha okay let's turn into the financial side of these things again we've had glenn on the on the show before so everyone should definitely go back and listen to the show we did with him I believe and it was november of last year so a little bit dated in terms of the, some of the topics we we're talking a lot about like miners failing at the time and like what options were out there for financing obviously times have changed but the way he thinks about it obviously has moved over to you guys with corman Tell me a little bit about your financial philosophy, how you guys think about your HODL, how you guys think about machine spending, uh, the immersion side, you spoke to that a little bit, and then, of course, the energy. Uh, okay, so you, we can start with our, our financing structure. I mean, it's uh, you start out in the mining industry and you want to find a way to get long a lot of Bitcoin at, with, with a leverage of somebody else's money or uh, a bunch of USD denominated leverage against your your ASIC equipment, um, which looks like sort of a, a a dollar levered bet on Bitcoin's appreciation. Everybody who becomes a miner, I think, shares a long-term bullish view on Bitcoin. So you know, it's difficult to turn away from that temptation. Uh, I feel like it's that, uh, you know, that picture of the guy praying and he's looking at the sort of scantily clad woman. Uh, where it says like USD leverage and he's a Bitcoin miner praying good, trying to resist the temptation of USD leverage. But um, we're on grid. We have credit requirements for everything we do around electricity um, and uh, whether that be posting to ERCOT or posting to power market counterparties or uh, you know any other form of, of energy market participation. That's already a hungry mouth to feed as far as credit and, and margin. Uh, the same thing happens when you look at using derivatives to hedge a Bitcoin futures position. Uh, the, the CME margin requirements for a BTC USD future are very, very expensive. And so you have to optimize for credit if you're going to be building a scalable big business here. And so we made the, the tough choice a long time ago to commit to Bitcoin denominated debt as our primary form of leverage in the business. And, uh, that's the product that we have in market right now where we are trying to reach Bitcoiners who are looking to generate some yield on their Bitcoin. And in return, we give them a first lien on the, all the assets of our business. So we're sort of going all in and risking our company on um, on this form of leverage and, and on this market, which is um, being able to build a relationship with Bitcoiners, offer them yield and, uh, and earning their trust over a number of years. Um, you know, just to touch on this a little more, if you look at the... The Bitcoin yield platforms that went bust in in the last bust cycle, they had mining businesses, right? So the 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 secrets out that the best way to generate Bitcoin denominated yield is to have a mining business. What those businesses did wrong is they had a duration and uh, and liability mismatch, right? They had a duration uh, mismatch on all of their liabilities, where 
if you were a depositor on BlockFi, you could come and call your collateral back at any time. You were earning interest daily on any BTC you deposited there. It was BTC denominated interest, but as part of the terms of service, you can come and take your money out at any time. So um, it takes many years to repay the cost of an ASIC, the cost of a Bitcoin mining facility um, on a loan. And so if your depositors can come and yank their collateral back, but you've got a you know, 12 months left on a loan to a Bitcoin miner, that's the same thing that's happening with regional banks right now. You have a duration problem in your risk management book. Um, we have brought a, a long duration product out to the market. And uh, now the, the sort of burden is on us to convince Bitcoiners to trust us with their uh, hard earned Bitcoin savings for a multi year period. Um, but that's what we're working on right now. I'm curious about some of like the plumbing with that or specifics. I should probably say, like, how do you guys think about the duration? Like, do you guys have public information on that this time that we could discuss uh, for how long it is? And then how do you guys think about managing the risk on your side, right? Because like, a dollar is more or less a dollar. Mm -hmm. It's sweeping inflation aside for a second. But Bitcoin goes up and down quite a bit. So, Right. When you guys are purchasing ASICs, how do you guys think about that? Are you purchasing equipment? Are you denominating all these purchases in Bitcoin or are you liquidating to, to USD? Uh, yeah, so we we denominate ASIC purchases in BTC. We look at the BTC denominated uh, earning power of the ASIC less the BTC denominated electricity cost of running the ASIC. To answer your question about whether or not we can talk about it, uh, yes, we can talk about it. It is a uh, what's called a Reg D 506C exempt uh, private placement offering, which is an SEC, um, I guess, requirement in order for us to be able to speak about this offering publicly, which we do want to do. We have to file a lot of paperwork with the SEC. We have to uh, we have a 70 page document that goes into every detail of our business and every possible risk, um, every financial uh metric accounting policy, cold storage, uh, you name it, uh, it, it's in this document. And um, so by f filing and submitting this document with the, the origination of these loans, we can talk about it publicly, but we have to be very strict about certifying that we can only take money from accredited investors and the burden of certifying that is on us. So that's another difference between the, the block fives and Celsius's of the last cycle is they were taking capital directly from retail investors um, and they were sort of sneaking through potentially uh, dubious uh, credit and, and, and lending exemptions. We got to go strictly accredited investors, and uh, and there's a pretty robust kind of regulatory framework surrounding the offering. But uh, it's a three-year note. It's got a 10% interest-only coupon, and it's got 30% um, of the the principal amount that you lend the company gets paid to you immediately in the form of uh, common stock warrants that are in the money struck at one cent. So we just raised a $30 million Series A. The shares were sold in that round at $6.60. And our lenders in this Bitcoin round are they get to buy shares at one penny. So um, you know, a little bit of a warrant sweetener for those, uh, those lenders. And uh, the reason why we're offering that is, um, you know, it's Bitcoin denominated lending and it, it, takes a, a lot of a kicker to get people to lend you their Bitcoin. So, Gotcha. So for the Series A and then like this lending program, how'd you guys think about that? Like, what was the rationale for going out to the market twice in such a short period of time? My, my understanding was like they're were, they were pretty fast back to back. Uh, well, we, I mean, if we fast forward to how Cormac came to be operating in its current site, Bitcoin mining companies have to get to scale quickly. And it's the only way that you can afford a high quality executive team with financial engineering, um, risk management power. All of those disciplines have to be very high quality, talented people. And that executive team is expensive. Um, so and the only way to afford that team is to have an operation that's of a certain scale. I think the minimum you can do is right around our size, but ideally you should even be bigger. Um, so we first looked for an asset that had a very large substation where we could build a scalable business and sort of make a big upfront investment in a high capacity substation and then build and scale when the market conditions were right uh, without having to go and get another site and you know stand up a, a team in a totally different jurisdiction. So in 
2021, we got the opportunity to purchase a decommissioned wind farm from a, a, a wind generation company who wasn't making any money because um, the wind is overbuilt out in West Texas and there's a, a transmission constraint blocking the export of that energy to Eastern Texas. And so their problem was our solution. We consume low cost power. They're generating power that has too low of a cost to be economically viable. So um, we got this substation, we started building there and um, you know, a substation is very expensive and infrastructure is very expensive. So you have this very big asset heavy, high upfront CapEx business where you have to put a lot of money in at the start and then you have a big balance sheet. And so um, just like any other form of commodity production, you invest a lot of money up front in hard assets, and then typically you use a little bit of leverage. It's very common for uh, oil and gas to use uh, USD debt. Same thing um, with, with other forms of mining, whether it's metals or what have you. Um, and so we are going after the, the typical commodity producer hedger model. The only difference is, is that we're borrowing in kind with the actual revenue that we produce. So we're, it would be like if you were going to go and finance a bunch of drill sites by borrowing barrels of oil up front and you owed back your lender barrels of oil. If somebody in the oil business could do that, they would do that all day long. It's just the logistical complexity of going and borrowing a bunch of barrels of oil and finding someone to sell them to, convert them to USD. You have storage friction, you have shipping friction, you have um, the gravity of the oil, the quality, the grade, all that stuff, you have to match it up. With Bitcoin, it's a zero storage, 24 seven global network. Uh, it's a monetary commodity. So there's no storage costs. It is a monetary uh, instrument. So borrowing in kind with the, the form of your revenue makes a ton of sense. So two questions on that. One, why have people traditionally not done this or we haven't heard of a ton of people doing this lately? And two, how do you think about this compared to equity raises that have been more predominant, either diluting shareholders when you're already public or an at-the-market offering that we've seen a lot of miners do, or a capital raise through selling shares uh, for a private company? Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, there are there definitely have been some Bitcoin-denominated debt uh, transactions in the past. I don't think anybody has done uh, right D506C like we're doing, which is a uh, you know, a bilateral loan between a company and a group of individuals. And then those individuals are all bound under the same terms with an intercreditor agreement. So that is a, a first of its kind thing where we're going directly to the market and saying, look, this is how we're going to be borrowing Bitcoin. And we'd love to uh, do business with you on this transaction using this standardized form. You know, it's, we heard about it, uh, when we asked about it, you know, so when we were originally acquiring this site, we talked to some companies who were in the space with financing businesses and they said, yeah, absolutely. We can lend Bitcoin. Um, but those were one off sort of, uh, just one party to one party bilateral type of agreements. Um, but I think philosophically, the reason why miners don't do it is, is what I touched on in the beginning of the show where they don't want to give up that sweet, sweet USD leverage on the upside. They want to keep that USD leverage and. Um, and then if Bitcoin goes up 5X or 40X like it did in 2017, then your liabilities remain denominated in USD and you keep all the gravy on the upside of Bitcoin. But for us, it's more about prudent risk management. Uh, just want to point out that if we had our financing structure when this bear market began in the spring of 2022, our liabilities would have gone down one for one with uh, our, our revenue and our assets. So... Um, a lot of the, the bankruptcies that happen in the mining industry, this financing structure would have prevented them. Uh, so you know, I don't want to lose my job. It took me a long time to, to get a substation in West Texas and, and to build a great team. Uh, and so I don't want to lose my job. So I don't want to go bankrupt. And that's why we borrow on Bitcoin mainly. And so we'll make less money in bull markets, but we will. Uh, it's much less likely that we would run into an insolvency issue. Interesting. Yeah. I I would like to think that more Bitcoiners would be interested in this. Tell me about the ordinals thing really quickly before we move on to talk about energy. And you guys have, I don't know if you inscribed it yet on chain, but I saw you comment uh, on a post on the mining pod Twitter that you guys had created a sort of like a, a note to be put on chain corresponding to this race. Yeah. yeah, we took a war bond and then uh, 
we had a a an, a web three nft artist um guy by the name of cookie who's a good friend of mine um we had him photoshop the war bond into a you know bitcoin denominated note and so we're big fans of ordinals um we're big fans of of anything that increases demand for bitcoin's block space um and we'd love to see more development in that in that area and uh i'd love i'm really happy that the ordinals thing is happening right now because it's it's opening up the debate again about what's the appropriate way to use bitcoin block space and and how should we think about demand for bitcoin block space or possibly settling non-monetary transactions or smart contracts in bitcoin's block space so we want to support that we want to be a part of it um so we're going to be issuing a, an actual physical or an, an ordinal serialized btc note with our loans that go out uh they have a cool watermark on them we'll put some easter eggs in in the watermarks um and yeah just want to kind of do our part to keep demand for block space humming along you know i love that uh, that's so cool from a background perspective what is been your philosophy on on bitcoin really quick before we get to the energy stuff because the ordinal thing has caught a lot of people flat-footed where they didn't like NFTs because of that was a scam. And then all of a sudden Bitcoin can support this mm -hmm. and it's driving transaction fees for miners. I don't know. It feels like it, this has been a lot of people have caught flat, but it was your been, was your thought been on that? Um, I mean, uh, look, I think sailor puts it elegantly in order for Bitcoin to work in the long run. Bitcoin mining has to be a successful industry. And if you look at the, long-term prospects of where transaction fees are right now uh, versus the block subsidy it does there is at least a possibility that we all have to acknowledge that the total block reward available is is substantially lower than what it is today and i think a lot of people get this this conversation a little bit mixed up by not being very specific about what's going to happen in this future scenario which is, here's the the way that I think about it. The reason why the subsidy is important and why high transaction fees are important is because they ensure that we have fast confirmation times. That's it. It's not gonna, they're not gonna rewrite the whole blockchain if, if fees and the subsidy are low. What we're gonna have is that merchants who are settling a transaction outside of the digitally native Bitcoin world and looking at the confirmation times and and the the mining incentive for a fast confirmation time, they're going to have a little bit more hesitancy around maybe settling a transaction quickly. So that's going to make Bitcoin less useful for exchange transactions, for real world transactions. It might complicate some of the lightning use cases. And so Bitcoin works right now because we have fast confirmation times. The reason why we have fast confirmation times is because everyone trusts in that the mining incentive is very, very healthy. Uh, I think the issue that we may run into in the future, I'm not sure about it, and if, if a fee market doesn't get robust within the next, say, 20 to 30 years, then total mining revenue as a percentage of Bitcoin's total market cap may skew very differently from where it is right now. Right now, it's about 1.5%, I think, total mining revenue available annually versus um, the total market cap of Bitcoin. And obviously with the halving, that's going to get cut in half. And with the 2028 halving, that'll get cut in half again. Um, so it's nice to see fees hovering between 0.15 and, and 0.4 BTC per block. Um, I know my bud, uh, Chris Bendixson over at CoinShares, he believes that that gross uh, block reward fees plus subsidy will never go below one Bitcoin. And um, if if he's correct about that, then I don't think we'll ever run into a problem. But there is a world where the mining incentive actually could get perverted, perverted if total block reward as a percentage of Bitcoin's market cap on an annual basis is, uh, is too far skewed away from where it is now, which is probably a healthy average. And I'd say it's probably oversecured at the moment. Love that. Thanks for that explanation. I want to go back to the war bond for a second. Then we'll go talk about energy. How are you looking at some of these miners that have gone public? And now we're in this sort of doldrum, low momentum. Are you thinking about going public in the next few years? That'd be something that you'd be open to talk about. How do you think about other miners who are in similar size categories as you guys right now who 
have attempted to go public or have been thinking about it, but have not been able to? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, certainly if you were public or went public in the 2021 bull market time, you gained a massive advantage. Um, mining businesses were trading at 20x EBITDA. The gross margins were all 85% or higher. All you needed was, uh, you know, a couple eggs of hash in a warehouse somewhere and, you know, you were a couple hundred million dollar business. So raising that capital, especially if you spent it wisely, I know some firms spent it more wisely than others. Some avoided debt um, and uh, obviously others did not. That's a huge advantage because if you look at EBITDA multiples right now, they're, they're um, in the single digit range and uh, 20x EBITDA seems like a, a very long ways away if we ever do get back there. But you know, you, you look at the way that uh, commodity production businesses are valued, they do go through boom and bust type of cycles and the gross margin of commodity producers during rabid bull markets and, and Bitcoin has bull markets that are unlike anything I've ever seen in any other type of commodity market. Um, you know, it, sometimes those, those uh, valuation multiples make sense because the gross margins are just are just absolutely killer. So um, the answer to your question is I'm interested and focused on delivering value to my shareholders. And that means being opportunistic about any potential path of giving them liquidity and monetizing their equity that is in front of me. So whether it's being acquired by another company, um, merging with a large energy, energy generation company to help them optimize their energy generation assets, especially ones who have a large portfolio and, and West loads on a Vercot or, um, you know, going public, um, whatever, whatever path it looks like the best result for our shareholders is the one that I'll be focused on, but there's an increased burden, uh, cost burden and administrative burden of being public. If we can find product market fit with our Bitcoin denominated offering and, you know, stay, stay in the private markets, give our shareholders liquidity and, and access all the funding that we need with the, the 600 billion in, in Bitcoin total addressable market that's just sitting out there, then that sounds really attractive to me. I'd rather be beholden to Bitcoiners and, and the values of the Bitcoin community than, than the stock market. Um, but just have to acknowledge that the funding opportunities and the liquidity in, in the United States, big public exchanges are, they're second to none. And that's, that's been a critical advantage for the, the guys who've taken advantage of that in the last bull run. Definitely. Okay. We've been teasing it. Talk, time talk about energy. Texas, really hot right now. Any quick thoughts on that? And then let's talk about your guys' energy strategy. What you guys did with the substation here. I mentioned that uh, a, a few times, but how you guys are thinking about energy build out in Texas? Yeah, I was just uh, checking the temperature. Uh, it's just real hot. It hit 100 degrees in Fort Stockton. Uh, and uh, we've been seeing um, regularly between 100 and 110. So, um, nothing new there. You know, we knew that that those temps were going to be there, and um, that's why we chose immersion. Um, I will say that last week was a prime example of of the ancillary value of a Bitcoin mining load in a deregulated grid like ERCOT, being that. If you buy a power purchase agreement, if you buy a 24-7 power purchase agreement and you're long energy and you have a Bitcoin mining load that can take that energy every hour of every day and profitably convert it into Bitcoin, then you also have the ability to curtail that mining load and respond to real-time energy prices. And I know that uh, all the miners in ERCOT who had power purchase agreements last week, they they were printing money when ERCOT power traded $5,000 a megawatt hour for, um, for almost four hours. So the, the way that we think about Bitcoin mining is not just, Hey, we're trying to, to convert electrons into Bitcoin as efficiently as possible. We're also thinking about monetizing energy volatility and, and adding a complementary revenue stream to the Bitcoin mining load that becomes more valuable the lower that Bitcoin mining revenue goes. So if you think about your Bitcoin mining load, that can be instantly curtailed in response to real-time energy prices. That looks a lot like a call option on electricity when you have a power purchase agreement. And the way that an option is priced is the closer that the strike price of the option is to the actual price of the underlying commodity that it is an option on, 
the higher the value is. And so if we look at the Bitcoin opportunity value for mining Bitcoin right now with a 30 joules per tera hash rig, it's about $95 a megawatt hour. The real time market price of electricity in Texas averages like $35, $40 a megawatt hour. So right now that, that call option is pretty far out of the money. Um, but if the halving were to occur tomorrow, then the Bitcoin opportunity value would drop to $47 a megawatt hour. That's $10 out of the money. That is a really juicy option. And so you have to think about what your Bitcoin mining load can do in an electricity grid. And what it can do is it can turn an instantly perishable commodity. I mean, electricity on the grid is the most perishable commodity on the planet. It needs to be balanced 100% every second of every day. And a Bitcoin mining load can convert that into probably one of the hardest commodities on earth, which is this, this zero storage cost money, um, zero storage cost, zero friction to move money. Um, and it can do that every second of every day. Uh, and so, uh, in ERCOT, we have a fully deregulated electricity market. The, the Texas grid allows market prices to drive participant behavior. So if prices are too low, they bring a lot of loads in there. They bring data centers in there. They bring industrial operations in there. They bring Bitcoin miners in there. If prices are too high, the generation market explodes. I mean, ERCOT Solar has doubled over the last two years and it's going to double again. And so they let free market pricing signals drive market participant behavior. And uh, what Bitcoin miners are doing there, if they're smart, is they are paying very close attention to the the ancillary value that the volatility associated with their mining load can bring to their business. It's got to be one of the best explanations I've heard on the Texas market. So well put. Tell me a little bit more about like how you guys are thinking of expanding within this market, or I think it's practical with, to expand within this market. The, the context for this, of course, is ERCOT is doing everything it can seemingly to increase the sort of flexible load onto the market. They just recently passed a bill making most Bitcoin miners over a certain megawatt size, uh, let them know to ERCOT that they are there. We've seen former ERCOT presidents come out and say, hey, we want more of these Bitcoin miners on the grid. At the same time, Bitcoin mining Texas is very hard, right? It's 100 degrees there right now. I think there's spots in Texas that are supposed to get to 115. You mentioned the dust. There's logistical issues. Like, is there more capacity to grow there? And are you guys like bullish on continuing to, to mine in Texas? Uh, we definitely are. Um, certainly where, where the industry is at now with 2,000 megawatts of mining load, you're starting to run into some... I don't want to call them issues, but I would call them areas of concern that that are being addressed um, with that amount of load that's able to respond that quickly to price because there's never really been anything like that. There's never been a perfectly economic consumer of electricity soaking up 2,000 megawatts of load on a, on a grid. It just doesn't, it's never existed. And so we work closely with ERCOT we encourage every other miner in in Texas to work closely with ERCOT to understand what ERCOT needs to help build the grid of the future. And the reason why we do that is because we think Texas is the ideological home of Bitcoin in the United States. We think the United States being the, the free market and, and um, liberty capital of the world is the rightful home of the the free market money of the world. We think free market money makes sense for the species. So, you know, it's like a uh, turtles all the way down type of thinking of why, why we believe that doing our part in building the best relationship between ERCOT and the Bitcoin mining community in the state of Texas makes a big difference down the, down the road. It's part of our, you know, our company's mission. It's probably the second or third most important thing is earn the trust, respect, uh, and and gratitude of ERCOT, be good citizens. Do whatever we can do to to give them a toolkit from the mining community that makes us indispensable. And that way, we'll have the best regulation with the state. Um, we'll be able to negotiate on on things that make our life easier, like a credit, uh, for example. You know that would help. Uh, and um, look, it's it, at its premise, they've structured the market the right way, being deregulated, allowing for price volatility. That it's going to be the best fit for Bitcoin miners. We just need to kind of keep it on track and keep the relationship good. And shout out Texas Blockchain Council, Lee Bratcher. Um, everyone should join up. 
that's the place to be if you're a Bitcoin miner in ERCOT and, uh, you know, go register with ERCOT. Love it. James, where can people find your stuff or anything else associated with Cormint? Uh, yeah, so we're obviously uh, Twitter, Cormint Inc., um, www.cormint.com. And uh, our lenders have a, a full, very close to real-time look at, at every single one of the metrics that we can share about the company. So we're kind of using the fact that we're a Bitcoin native company, all of our loans are Bitcoin, all of our revenue is Bitcoin, and we buy power in a public and regulated ISO being ERCOT that publishes their prices every five minutes. So, you know, from those inputs, you can get a really good view at our unit economics. So our lenders are able to sort of access real-time profitability and, uh, and economic metrics about the business every minute of every day, including cold storage and all that good stuff. So yeah, Cormit.com, follow us on Twitter, uh, subscribe to the mining pod if you don't already. There we go. And go to church. Love it. Yeah, we'll have to have another conversation about uh, Bitcoin mining, church, religion, state, and maybe even bringing some stuff from your Telegram bio, which is separation of money and state, but integration of dog and man. That's an, <laughs> it's an interesting take there. Uh, but we'll get to that on a different dog, show. Dog, money, dog and money. Dog, dog and money. Dogecoin. Yeah. I'm, I want to give a Dogecoin plug if that's okay. Oh, do it. Yeah. It's your moment. I think Dogecoin is the ultimate test for for people within the the cryptocurrency world. I know it's a joke, right? Yeah. You know, that the whole meme of like Jackson you know, starting the project and then getting upset when people adopted it and memed it. And, you know, since then, now you have Elon and all this, this late stage Dogecoin adoption tomfoolery. I'm not going to make an argument about buying Dogecoin, investing in Dogecoin. I, I really, I own like a thousand Dogecoin. I own nothing. Um, but what I will say is, when you explain the idea of Dogecoin to someone, say you have no other conversations with them about cryptocurrency, you say, well, it's, you know, it's a dog money. And it's funny because the dog is sort of, it's a Japanese dog. It speaks broken English and it's meme. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, they put it on a coin and then everybody says Dogecoin to the moon. It's really fun. And that person says, that's ridiculous. This is a ridiculous premise. And they get upset. They become emotionally agitated about it. It's the perfect litmus test for if their brain is ready for the concept of of a cryptocurrency. Hmm. Because they've got a predefined notion of what money is. They haven't come to understand that all money is, is fiction. And it's all just a psychological construct that's completely derived on the faith in the underlying, whatever the premises for distribution, the strength of the network, the utility, uh, you know, what makes a money a money. It's, and, uh, and for that reason, I like Dogecoin. I like Dogecoin a lot because it's a good litmus test for a person's brain's readiness to crypto. I think that was the first only and best shill for Dogecoin on okay, the didn't win. So no, it was great. I was honestly actually mostly agree with that. Like ninety nine percent. That was pretty good. My business partners will string me up if the Dogecoin makes it into the full <laughs> That's okay. It's Texas, right? They can do sort of stuff like that. Get you uh get you out there. Okay. We'll close out there. James, thank you so much. Thank Talk you. To you soon. Talk to you soon.